Have you ever been so embarrassed that you just wanted to disappear? Never happened to me. I've heard it's, I've heard it's terrible. No. No, it happens to me all the time. One time uh, more than any other time it happened to me. I have a, what doctors call a really strange sense of humor. And I went through this phase years ago where I would pretend that if you offended me, I had the pastoral power to strike you with blindness. And so sometimes as a joke, I would just say, blindness. And one Sunday night in Michigan, Jen will attest to this, I am not making this up, I wish I was. One night in Michigan, somebody said something snarky from the congregation, and I said, blindness, having no idea that there was a blind lady in our church. I was mortified. Uh, for years, even now, even thinking about it, my kids will sometimes bring it up just to torture me. I was so mortified and embarrassed. Sometimes we're impulsive and we do stupid things. I know somebody else, I won't tell you her name, but I know somebody else pretty well who once walked up to a lady in Walmart and asked her how far along she was. And the lady said, I'm not pregnant. And she was mortified. Sometimes we do or we say stupid things. And God, for whatever reason, lets that happen and lets people notice. He exposes the foolishness of the imprudent. And tonight we're going to see that Saul the first king of Israel, in a mad dash to, impre to improve his street cred, made a foolish and silly oath, not only for himself, but imposed it upon the people of Israel. And we're going to see the disastrous results of his imprudence. And so first of all, let's look then in 1 Samuel chapter 14, starting in verse 24. It says, now the men of Israel were hard-pressed on that day. Let's just stop right there. The rest of the account tonight will outline for us why Israel was put in such a bad position. And you would think maybe they're in a bad position because they did not have the military might to stand up to the Philistines. Or maybe they were in a bad position because they ate something that didn't agree with them. But no, we're going to see that they were in a bad position because of something Saul did without properly thinking through the ramifications. In fact, the, the verse will tell us. Let's read in verse 24. It says this, For Saul had put the people under oath, saying, Cursed be the man who eats food before evening, and before I have avenged myself on my enemies. Well, let's just analyze this for a second. Saul's entire claim to fame was his military success. That's what he brought to the table. That, and he was tall. That's pretty much it. And the way he continued to be revered in the eyes of the Israelites was by wiping out his enemies. And so now, in a, in a bizarre moment of impetuous pride, he says this, nobody's allowed to eat until I'm victorious. What a silly thing to do. Because he has no idea how long it's going to be until he has victory. I mean, don't raise your hand or anything, but how many of you have ever woken up on January 1st of any given year and say, you know what, this year I'm dropping 50 pounds, right? And you go great. I mean, you have a, a grapefruit black coffee for breakfast, and you're thinking, you know what, I, I got it this time. By two o'clock in the afternoon, you are stuffing donuts into your mouth like they're a life raft and you're in the ocean. We tend to make big promises without really thinking through whether or not we have the strength or the resolve to follow them through. 
So what was the result of this impetuous, foolish oath? Well, we'll see here in verse 24. It says, Now the men of Israel were hard-pressed on that day, for Saul had put the people under oath, saying, Cursed be the man who eats food before evening, and before I have avenged myself on my enemies. So look, so none of the people tasted food. Now here's the problem. When you are warriors, when you are in an army, you know what you really need? food. In fact, not allowing them to eat actually prevented his victory in the first place. That if he would have let them eat, they would have been stronger, they would have been refueled, they would have been rested, they would have been ready. But instead, they get extraordinarily hungry, and we're going to see how bad it really gets. So let's ask this question, why was Saul's oath so foolish? Well, first of all, like we said, it resulted in the people being hard-pressed. Now, this Hebrew word here for hard-pressed really means shaken or jostled. It means that his imprudent oath led not him to suffer as much, but led all the people to suffer. Saul put the people under oath, not out of any genuine religious zeal, we'll see this later, but out of a foolish pride. This is what Saul wanted. He wanted the entire army to be laser-focused on his victory. And how do you do that? You take food from them so that they would be hungry to win. And this pride was the result, will result in making the lives of the people harder for no really good reason at all. See, that's what happens when humans make silly rules to show how righteous they are, even if they're temporary. Even, it just shows how puffed up we can get for no really good reason. Another reason why Saul's oath was so foolish is, it that, is that it resulted in the people being tempted, and it's always that way. January 1st, you wake up, you say, I will not eat donuts. I will not eat donuts. Well, what are you thinking about? Donuts, and they're delicious. So you keep thinking about it, and then come lunchtime, you want donuts. Imagine this. Saul just told all of the army, they are not allowed to eat until he wins, and notice the next verse. Verse 25. All the people of the land entered the forest, and there was honey on the ground. You see that? I mean, they didn't just see a little honeycomb or a little jar with a little honey in it. They go into the forest, and honey is everywhere. Now, in normal human life, they would chalk that up to God's providence and say, the Lord has provided and they would have eaten that honey and their eyes would have got bright and they would have slew their enemies. But they weren't allowed to. And to see how far it goes, look at this, beloved. In verse 26, when the people entered the forest, behold, there was honey dripping. I mean, it wasn't just on the ground. It wasn't cleverly packaged. It was literally dripping from the sky, from the trees. And all they had to do was this. And their mouth would be filled, and their strength would be renewed, and their energy would be returned. But Saul made them take an oath of not eating anything. And Saul, I, I, I could almost guarantee you, I, if I, I would bet dollars to donuts, that Saul's walking through that forest feeling great about himself. Nobody eats until I win. And every step, the men not only get weaker, but they're surrounded by temptation. First of all, it's a big deal to lead people into temptation. I know that you, you've heard this. You may not realize this, but Jesus had really strong words for people who lead other people into temptation. In Matthew 18, 7, it says, Woe to the world because of its stumbling blocks. For it's inevitable that stumbling blocks come, but woe to that man through whom the stumbling block comes. And that's Saul. 
If Saul didn't make this silly oath, everybody would have had a little honey and would be no worse for wear. They'd be stronger, they'd be energized, they'd be back at it. God would not have been dishonored at all. In fact, God would have been honored because they would have looked up into the sky and got out of the way of the dripping honey and said, Father, thank you for providing this for us. But somebody, Saul, for some reason, pride made it against the rules. And they stumbled. Not now, but way worse later. Matthew 6, 13 says this, and do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. That's our prayer. God never leads us into temptation. Saul did. So how did Saul's oath result in, tem in temptation? Well, first of all, they were led into a forest with honey all over the place. What's the point? Silly rules only result in silly sins. Their oath did not make them more godly. It just made them more hungry. And we're going to see how far it gets. But let me remind you of what Colossians 2, 23 and its context says. And you can look this up later if you can get there quick. I'm about to read it. When Paul was talking about man-made rules in order to honor God, this is what he said. These are matters which do, not ha which do have the appearance of wisdom in self-made religion and humility and severe treatment of the body, but are of no value against fleshly indulgence. Paul says to withhold from people things that could be honestly and righteously enjoyed does not make them better Christians, does not make them better Jews, does not make them better soldiers. It just makes them hungrier. It's always dangerous to have a microphone near an Italian behind the pulpit, you know. So why was Saul's oath so foolish? Thirdly, this oath resulted in people being scandalized. I mean, think about it. How many times are people offended over things they really shouldn't be offended over? Well, they're only offended over those things because someone made it a rule. Look what we find in verse 27. However, Jonathan had not heard it when his father put the people under the oath, so he put out the end of his staff that was in his hand, and he dipped it in the honeycomb, and he put his hand to his mouth, and his eyes brightened. Have you ever seen somebody taste honey and their eyes brighten? You know why? Because it's good. Especially when you're hungry, thirsty, depleted. So he puts it to his mouth and his eyes brightened. Then one of the people responded and said, Ooh, you can't do that. He says, your father strictly put the people under oath, saying, cursed be the man who eats food today. Now notice this, beloved. And the people were weary. Man-made religion wearies people. It doesn't make them better. It makes them weary. And Saul thinks he's great because he made this silly oath. And all he is doing is wearying his people. And he's causing a scandal that never needed to happen. They were scandalized because they knew Jonathan broke the rules, but he didn't know. And notice how Jonathan responds. Verse 29. Jonathan says what everybody else was thinking, but they didn't have the guts to say it. You know what we find here? Notice verse 29. My father has troubled the land. He goes on to say, look, look how bright my eyes got. A little honey's not bad. Verse 30, how much more if only the people had freely eaten today of the spoils of their enemies. Remember that phrase, the spoils of their enemies, which they found, for now the defeat among the Philistines has not been great. 
Johnson says, we were actually kept from victory because we didn't eat. Jonathan implies what they were already thinking, but they were afraid to say, Saul is dumb. He's dumb for troubling the land. He's dumb because of how Jonathan's eyes lit up. It would have been better for all of them. He's dumb because the army would have fared better if they they were allowed to refuel. See, Saul thought he was doing something pious, something godly, when he was actually doing something silly, impulsive, and foolish. Now, if it just stopped there, we would be, we would wonder really what what the big deal is. All right, so the army didn't get to eat, and they could have won, but they didn't, and they didn't. Well, we'll see that this oath resulted in the people being grotesquely sinful. Look with me at verse 31, my friends. They, that's the army, attacked the Philistines that day from Michmash to Aijalon, but the people were very tired. Well, why? Because they were hungry, real hungry. Verse 32, so the people, people loudly rushed upon the spoils, took sheep, oxen and calves slaughtered them on the ground and the people ate them with the blood you see the picture here they were so hungry that they basically ripped open the the animals and ate them raw or at the very least they didn't drain the blood like israelites were supposed to do why they were so hungry they didn't want to wait now that eating blood is a really big sin in Old Testament times. And whose fault was it? Well, sure, it was theirs a little bit, but it was really Saul's fault for his silly oath. They're ripping into animals like they're animals. And it all could have been avoided with a little bit of honey dripping from the trees. Notice Saul's rebuke to these people. This is, this is where it's, it's kind of hard to stomach, no pun intended. All right, maybe a little pun intended. Verse 33. Then observers informed Saul, saying, Look, the people are sinning against the Lord by eating meat with the blood. And Saul says, You know what, guys? This is on me. I shouldn't have imposed such a strict rule on you. No. Notice what he says. He says, you have acted treacherously. Roll a large rock to me today. Saul didn't see himself as the problem. Saul saw himself as the solution. His brain was out of whack. He was so impressed with himself. It doesn't even seem to dawn on him that his silly, impulsive oath Cause the problem. Instead, he says, people are sinning against the Lord by eating with the blood. And he says, I'll fix this. And notice what he does. He makes an altar, and this is just almost too much. Verse 34, then Saul said, disperse yourselves among the people and say to them, each one of you bring me his ox or his sheep And slaughter it here and eat, and do not sin against the Lord by eating it with the blood. So all the people brought them that night, each one his ox with him, and they slaughtered them there. Did you see what happened? Verse 35, and Saul built an altar to the Lord. It was the first altar that he built to the Lord. We don't see any repentance from him. We see bold sinful pride. He doesn't seem to recognize that it's his fault. He doesn't seem to recognize that he put the people in an awkward position. Instead, he builds an altar to remind the people of how good Saul is and how sinful they are. Now, at this point in the account, what we really want is for Saul to get some uh, comeuppance. 
You ever hear that word, comeuppance? We want Saul to be embarrassed. We want Saul to be exposed. And that's exactly what God does. Through his providence... This oath then resulted in the people experiencing the silence of God. Saul said in verse 36, Let's go down to the Philistines by night. Let's take plunder among them until morning light, and let's not leave a man among them alive. And they said, Do whatever seems good to you. So the priest said, Let's approach God here. Now, I want you to notice in verse 36 what he just said. Saul wants to continue his military conquest. And he says this, let's go down against the Philistines, and notice this, and take spoil among the people until morning light. Is this a coincidence? I think not. What is he saying? He's saying, let's keep eating. Let's go to the Philistines, and let's take everything from them, and let's fill our stomach with the spoil. Well, this shows us Saul probably recognized deep in his heart that the whole eating the blood thing was a result of his foolishness. So in verse 37, Saul inquired of God, shall I go after the Philistines? Will you hand them over to Israel? Notice this, but he did not answer him on that day. And you know what Saul thinks? Saul thinks God's mad at Israel because they were eating the animals on the ground with their blood. No. God is mad, or God is showing his displeasure at Israel because of Saul's foolish oath. And notice, friends, what we find. The oath resulted in a need for Saul to shamefully capitulate. In verse 41, it says this. In verse 40, sorry, it says this. Then he said to all Israel, you shall be on one side, and I am my son Jonathan will be on the other side. What is he trying to do? He's trying to set them up so that God would say it's their fault, not Saul's fault. Verse 41, therefore Saul said to the Lord God of Israel, give a perfect lot, and they cast lots, and Jonathan and Saul were selected by lots, but the people were exonerated. Now, notice that. It's not the people's fault. The silence of God came upon Israel because of Saul and Jonathan. Verse 43, so Saul said to Jonathan, tell me what you have done. And Jonathan told him, said, I did indeed taste a little honey with the end of the staff that was in my hand. And notice this, here I am. I must die. Now, we don't get a tone here, but I think there has to be a little sarcasm here. Because Jonathan has already shared with the people that Saul's decision was dumb. And Jonathan says, I tasted honey, kill me. I deserve to die for tasting honey dripping from the trees as God's providence. He doesn't say, I didn't know. He said, your command, your oath was stupid, kill me. And you know what? Saul would have. Isn't that amazing? Saul would have killed his own son just to save his pride. Notice. Verse 44, Saul said, May God do the same to me and more also, for you shall certainly die, Jonathan. Saul was about to kill his kid because his kid unwittingly disobeyed an order that Saul should have never given in the first place. And you know what happens? The people stand up. And they say, Saul, this is ridiculous. Notice verse 45. The people said to Saul, must Jonathan die? He who has brought about this great victory in Israel? Far from it. As the Lord lives, not even a hair on his head shall fall to the ground because he has worked with God this day. So the people rescued Jonathan and he didn't die. You see, the people only have a certain amount of tolerance for foolish, impulsive leadership. And they were, they're not going to stand for it. They're not going to let Jonathan be put to death because Saul made this oath. Now, here's what happened. 
Saul lost credibility. As a leader, that's really one of the main things you need. And he lost it. And so in verse 46, it said this, And Saul went up from pursuing the Philistines, and the Philistines went to their own place. Now remember, Saul's claim to fame is his military victory. But he knew once he lost the respect of the people, he could not lead them into battle. So he went home. Now, we'll go quickly through this next section, but it's important to note that foolishness in one area inevitably leads to foolishness in another. And I'm I'm sure we would all agree and understand that we're all kind of foolish. We all do dumb things. But again, Saul was respected and known for his military success. And he had great military success. He was just severely and scandalously flawed, like every other leader. Notice what we find in the passage starting in verse 47. Now when Saul had taken control of the kingdom over Israel, he fought against all his enemies on every side, against Moab, sons of Ammon, Eden, the kings of Zobah, the Philistines, and wherever he turned, he inflicted punishment. And he acted valiantly and defeated the Amalekites and saved Israel from the hand of those who plundered them. By the way, the rest of Saul's story is going to be negative. We're going to see starting next week. The rest of Saul's story is sad. So Samuel gives us one more little snippet of just how great he was as a military leader. As a man of God, he was scandalous. Verse 49 tells us, Now the sons of Saul were Jonathan, Ishvi, Malkishua, and the names of his two daughters were these. The name of the firstborn was Merav, and the name of the younger, Michael. Now that's going to be important later. Because Saul is going to use his daughter, Michael, to try to deceive and manipulate the next king. He's going to use his own daughter, Michael, as a way to try to get David killed. Saul is not a good guy. And it's starting to unravel now. We'll see it more later. And notice this. In verse 52, now the war against the Philistines was severe all the days of Saul, and when Saul saw any warrior or any valiant man, he attached him to his staff. Instead of killing and destroying his enemies, he adopted them. Now that doesn't seem bad, but we're going to see next week that God commanded him to destroy his enemies but what he did was try to make his enemies his friends. Saul was willing to kill his own son in order to avoid this breakdown in pride, and he was also willing to compromise with foreign kings. So here's an application. Pompous, foolish oaths lead to ridiculous, scandalous results. The Bible says that when we promise to do something, we need to follow through even if it's embarrassing. We have to be men and women of our word. So be careful what you say because you just can't say you have to do. Remember in seminary, my Old Testament Hebrew professor He just made a tremendous blunder. Somebody walked up to him and said, I have a whole box of my book, and I want you to hand them out to your students. And my professor did not look at the books. He just said, sure, free books, I'll hand them out. And then when he looked at the books, he saw that they were absolute garbage. I can't get into the reasons why, but trust me, you would agree. And so he stood up in front of the class and he says, this is really embarrassing, but I'm going to give you this book and I want you to throw it in the trash on your way out. He said, I promised I would hand out the book, but I don't want you to read it because it's blasphemous. And so we did what he told us to do. We took the book, 
And everybody but one student, to my knowledge, threw it in the trash on the way out. You know who didn't? Me. Because it really piqued my interest. But you know what curiosity did to the cat? So I brought it home. I started thumbing through it. I'm like, this book is garbage. So I threw it out. Moral of the story is he was really embarrassed because he said he would do something before he looked into the facts. Don't do that. Make sure you know what you're signing up for. Make sure you know to what you are committing yourself. Because it's better not to swear than it is to swear and have to cancel. I'll leave you with this. Thomas Brooks, one of my favorite dead preachers, Puritan guy, said this, zeal is like fire. In the chimney, it's one of the best servants. But out of the chimney, it's one of the worst masters. Isn't that great? Isn't that true? A fire in the fireplace is great. A fire on the living room floor is not. If the couch is on fire, it's not a good thing. He says, zeal kept by knowledge and wisdom in its proper place is a choice servant to Christ and saints. But zeal not bounded by wisdom and knowledge is the high way to undo all and to make a hell for many at once. What a powerful statement. Saul had zeal. He just didn't have knowledge. He didn't think it through. Let's not make the same mistake. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we want zeal. We long for it. We need it. But Lord, zeal without knowledge is a dangerous thing. Zeal without prudence can be a dangerous thing. And so Lord, I pray that you would protect us from Saul's bad example. And instead that you would help us to, to make logical, reasonable, measured decisions. And Lord, we thank you that you don't lead us into temptations, but you deliver us from evil because yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Would you please protect us? Protect us from our attempts to look great in front of others, to, to appear mightier than we are. Would you protect us from ourselves? To the praise of your glory, in Jesus' name, amen.